Welcome to this lecture series on the road to secession. We're going to begin with part one, a house divided. As we approach the Civil War, we see that the North and the South become more and more sectionalized. They become just two different worlds entirely. Uh, in the North, we find that in the North, the population is going to be larger, right? Uh, the population is going to grow um, at a greater rate. It's going to be more urbanized, right? It's going to have more larger cities in it. Um, it's going to be more industrialized, right? It's going to have a larger industrial base. In fact, the industrial base of just the state of New York is four times that of the entire South, right? Uh, it is dominated by Yankee Protestantism, right? Which is uh, focused on the salvation of the community, you know, kind of that Puritan value kind of seeping in there, uh, which of course makes them uh, reformist, right? They uh, are pro-temperance, right? Pro-public education, abolitionist, of course. Uh, a free labor ideology, things like that. And when they looked at the South, they saw the South as uh, the part of the United States that's holding us back, right? We would be uh, uh, booming if it wasn't for the South and its conservative uh, ways. As for the South, the South, of course, had fewer cities. Its largest city was New Orleans, which had a population of about 160,000. It was overwhelmingly agriculture, uh, uh, agricultural. It's uh, about 90% of the population was involved in farming in some way or form, right? Whereas in the North, it was, you know, maybe about 40 to 50%. Um, it's individualistically Protestant. In other words, salvation of self, not salvation of the uh, communities. And therefore, it's kind of anti-reformist, right? Um, and when the uh, South takes a look at the North, they see the North as cold and money hungry and, and godless, right? So these two sides just become more and more varied. So ultimately, a civil war is going to break out between the North and the South. And so when we take a look at the causes of the civil war, we have to take a look at three fundamental questions here. The first question is this. What were the causes of the sectional tension between the North and the South? Right. And the answer to that is that moral conflict over slavery, right? That conflict over whether slavery was morally uh, necessary for society like the South, or a moral sin, like was uh, believed in the North. That leads to the next question, then. If that's the case, then what were the causes of secession, right? What caused them to actually decide to pull the trigger and leave? leave? Well, that boils down to the election of Abraham Lincoln. It was fear caused by the uh, Lincoln administration and what that meant to the institution of slavery. Southerners are never going to be able to divest themselves from the idea that Abraham Lincoln, equals Republican. Republican equals party of abolition, abolitionism, and abolitionism equals they're going to attack slavery here in the South, right? Uh, they're never going to be able to break away from that, and so ultimately you're going to have secession. The third and final question then is, why didn't the North just let them go? Why didn't they just say, you know what, fine, you're holding us back anyways, to hell with you guys, good luck. Well, again, that goes back to Lincoln. Lincoln and his American nationalism, right? Others too, but Lincoln was the president of the United States and he was not gonna let the South to just, just walk away and break up the band, if you will. He wanted to keep the Union together. It was a priority for him. Now, along with this, we have two important points that we need to consider. Uh, first of all, slavery was a disruptive issue prior to 1850, but many had worked pretty hard to try and settle it or at the very least post postpone it rather than let it destroy the Union. Many people like Henry Clay will keep trying to find some way to push it off to the next generation, right? The second important point was slavery was the principal issue behind the South's ultimate secession and the Civil War that resulted, right? No matter what other excuse you see people give, you can always trace it back to slavery. No thing ever has a single cause, right? If I get hit with a baseball bat, one of the reasons why is I didn't duck, right? But it's not the sole reason. Something motivated that person to take the swing, or maybe it's an accident or whatever, right? Um, so slavery is the primary reason, a principal reason, right, amongst the other reasons out there.
And if you ever hear uh, some of the arguments for the other issues, which were also uh, components of but not a primary issue in secession, and they say, no, it was uh, state rights or or uh, the economic reasons or whatever, you can always just point that individual to the actual Articles of Secession for each of the southern states in the first place. Because typically, those Articles of Secession will implicitly state slavery as the reason that they're leaving. Like take Mississippi here. It says, the institution of slavery existed prior to the formation of the federal constitution and is recognized by its letter and all efforts to impair its value or lessen its duration by Congress or any of the free states is a violation of the compact of union and is destructive to the ends for which it was ordained. But in defiance of the principles of the union thus established, the people of the northern states have assumed a revolutionary position towards the southern states. They are attacking our institution of slavery and therefore we're leaving. Right. That's just one example. But there's others. Every state's going to tell a similar story. So, of course, we need to take a quick look at Texas even, right? Even Texas's Articles of Secession draws this out. It says, whereas the recent developments in federal affairs make it evident that the power of the federal government is sought to be made as a weapon for which to strike down the interests and property of the people of Texas. What property are they talking about? Right? They're talking about property in slaves. Uh, and her sister's slave-holding states, instead of permitting it to be as was intended, our shield against outrage and aggression, Right? All of this can constantly be drawn back to the issue of slavery. So while there were other sectional issues, any one of them we look at, we can kind of draw back to slavery if we just examine them. For example, the protective tariffs. Protective tariffs were designed to uh, uh, protect American business interests, right? Uh, like say with the textile mills. But the result of that was is that for the South, they felt it was an assault on their export businesses, right? It limited that. It also forced them to buy, um, say, uh, woven cotton fabric from the North rather than cheaper uh, markets from abroad, which they felt was an attack on their institution by making it more expensive to clothe their slaves, right? You had the issue of internal improvements. Most internal improvements in the United States had taken place in the North. Well, there's actually a reason for that. There's more of a population up in the North. Now, most of those internal improvements were also done at state expense, not federal expense. And so Northerners kind of felt it was unfair that since they had paid for their improvements, why is the South expecting the federal government to pay for theirs, right? Um, Western lands. Again, uh, Northerners wanted land in the West to be more expensive. Why? Well, to make it harder for the typically poor Southern slaveholding states to be able to purchase land and expand slavery out West, right? Uh, state sovereignty. That's that whole thing, too, you know, where the Southerners would often fall back on that. You know, they are violating our state rights, but our state rights to what? Well, our state rights to own slaves, right? So none of these uh, issues are as divisive as slavery is. And when you add slavery into the mix of any of these issues, it makes that issue very explosive.